stage and all the others out here and the rest who have come. I would like to introduce two family members here. I think there's two here. I have two granddaughters with me, Lisa and Linda. They're sisters and <laughs> which is, of course, very important. As has been said, and as I've said for many years, the Constitution is a rather important document. And that we should uphold it. And the, and the Constitution is very clear. The Constitution is very clear on what the responsibilities are at the federal level. The federal level, the defense is a vital function of the government. from the problems overseas may magnify. 
The Soviet system collapsed for economic reasons, not for military reasons. So we have to maintain a healthy economy every bit as much as we have to have a strong national defense. One of the reasons we've gotten into trouble overseas has been, we have been told, the rules. It's been a long time since this country declared a war. The last time we did it, after we were attacked, and properly so, we, uh, we attacked uh, both Japan and Germany, and guess what? It was declared by the Congress and is supported by the people. It was over in approximately four years. We had proper authority and we were together. Since that time, we haven't done it. I maintain that the president should never take a country to war unless there is a declaration of war.
can't afford a policy, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So often we go around and we find a friendly dictator and say, well, our national security interests are best if we prop up this dictator. No matter what he does to his people, we've done it numerous times, so we give him a lot of money. Then it goes badly and he changes his mind and then we have a fight. Then there's other countries we go to and they don't want to cooperate with us, so uh, we just go ahead and we use weapons of man, uh, weapons and destroy their country and bomb those countries. So we either use force of money, force of money. And I thought, well, there has to be another option. How about talking to them once in a while instead of using force and intimidation? service in 1962 during the missile crisis in Cuba. That, that was resolved rather quickly, but then I was in the Air Force for five years later. I did not go to Vietnam, but it was during that period of time. But if you add up the decade the French were there and the decade the, the, the Americans were in Vietnam, trying to settle a civil war in Vietnam, how many people were killed? Probably maybe a million Vietnamese, tens of thousands of uh, of. Uh, French soldiers, and then 60,000 Americans, then we had to leave after all this money and waste. And what did that usher in economically? They said, and Johnson at the time said, we can have lunch and butter, it doesn't matter. Spend money on more welfare and more guns than they gave us the 60s, which were a very, very uh, bad time. But the argument for us to go there, it, well, it wasn't the argument to go to the Congress and find out whether we should declare war or not. The argument was that if we don't go there and stop communism from rolling over, there'll be a domino effect and that whole region will turn communist. Well, it turned out that we walked away from there after a lot of tragedy. China, they became less communistic than we left. They became capitalistic in many ways and now they're our banker. <laughs> So what is, what's happened in Vietnam? Has it gotten worse? Did they go communist? No. All of a sudden they became westernized. They lied by looking at what we were doing. They started trading and, and interrelating with us. We travel there, we invest there, they come here. And just think of what has been achieved between our two countries in peace and what was not achieved in war and waste. We need to a much better, peace, a much better chance for peace. But also what we need is we also have to have prosperity as well, and therefore economic conditions are so important. Debt is the big problem right now that we're facing, and we have to admit it. So even if somebody would say, no, we can't cut a nickel out of the military budget, just remember the military budget is different than the defense budget. The military budget is all the, what all the weapons the military industrial complex wants. But there is a big difference between that. But today, both leaders, the leaders of both parties are not interested in cutting one nickel out of overseas expenditures. Most of them want to increase it. And they're furious if you don't mean the automatic increases. And my suggestion is different. My suggestion is that we have problems here at home, we're spending too much money overseas, we're getting in too much trouble. Our obligation is to take care of the people here at home a long time before we ought to be the policemen of the world. Stop spending so much money overseas. 
Now that should be a lot easier for we, the people, to come together, both the liberals, moderates, conservatives, if they want to concentrate on taking care of America, why can't we come together and, and stop this spending overseas? I would think that would be the easiest place in the world to cut spending. So half of the spending that I'm proposing in that first year would come from overseas spending.
in debating us, then what are our concerns about it? To me, it's, it's, it is the economy and the way we've lived beyond our means and the way we have become careless with our liberties that we allow our government to do too much. We had a, a major crisis, of course, a, a, a major event which was so terrible for us to, to uh, withstand. That, of course, happened on 9-11. 9-11, you know, was a very bad episode, and uh, a lot had to be done, but, but uh, we didn't do exactly the right things at the right time. For instance, one of the first things they did within days before they decided who did what and where we go, they passed a piece of legislation that had been floating around for years, and they shoved it on the floor, and within an hour it was passed, and nobody had time to read it, and that was the Patriot Act, and that took away your Fourth Amendment rights, and we don't need the Patriot Act. Sat down next to another member, 
and, I, and he was voting for it. Guess what? I was voting against it. Guess <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. Woo! laughs> what? So, I said to him, I said, you might be voting for this. I said, probably don't even know what's in it. You haven't had a chance to rent it. Oh, I know that. I said, you know, there's going to be some bad stuff in there, don't you? And I told him a few things. Yeah, I know that. I said, why are you going to vote for it? He says, well, the conditions are, we just had this attack. People want us to do something. It is called the Patriot Act. How can I vote against the Patriot Act? He said, what would I do if I had to go home and explain it to him? I said, well, that's your job. Go home and explain it to him. <laughs> months or two years, I don't know, but it's real soon. We are able, from an Austrian perspective in economics, to predict certain events will come. We can't tell when. Austrian 